Hi folks, and welcome to an overview of the SharePoint framework in Teams. My name is Loki Mayberg. I'm one of the program managers on the Microsoft Teams platform. Today I'm super excited to talk to you about building web parts in SharePoint and how you can surface those in Teams. At the end of the presentation, I'll also briefly talk about how you can take your Teams tab and surface that inside of SharePoint. Without further ado, let's get started. Let's talk about the SharePoint framework. The SharePoint framework is a developer toolkit that provides full support for modern client-side SharePoint development easy integration with SharePoint data, and support for open source tooling. With the SharePoint framework, you can use modern web technologies and tools in your preferred development environment to build productive experiences and apps that are responsive as well as mobile ready from day one. The SharePoint framework works for SharePoint Online and supports many open source tools and is JavaScript web framework agnostic. Another key advantage is that developers can leverage all of SharePoint's capabilities, including lists, files, security, CDNs, and integration with Microsoft Graph and Azure Active Directory Secured APIs to deliver full end-to-end -end applications for their organization. This, in turn, helps reduce operational costs and minimizes deployment complexity. In short, if you're thinking about building an app as an enterprise or office developer, then the SharePoint framework is the preferred way to do it because it's free and extremely powerful because it takes care of so much of the plumbing for you. Next, let's talk about open source tooling. The SharePoint framework leverages an open source Node.js based toolchain and embraces all web frameworks and code editors. The toolchain is based on common open source client development tools such as NPM, TypeScript, Yeoman, Webpack, and Gulp. Later, I will show you how to use the Yeoman generator to generate a project scaffold to get you started developing in the SharePoint framework. The SharePoint framework is also web framework agnostic, so you can use any JavaScript framework you like such as React, Angular, and more. SharePoint uses a beautiful UI library developed by the Office team called Fabric. If you wish to use Fabric out of the box, then I would recommend sticking to React or Angular, since those are supported by Fabric, giving you access to lots of cool UI components for free. There are also a number of useful SharePoint framework plugins for the common code editor. For Visual Studio, there are a few useful extensions to help with debugging, localization, and running common tasks. Let's talk about web parts. Web parts are the basic building blocks of pages that appear on a SharePoint site. SharePoint client-side web parts are controls that appear inside of a SharePoint page, but they can run locally in the browser. They add functionality to SharePoint experiences by providing static or dynamic content. Some of the more popular web parts that come with SharePoint are the group calendar, file viewer, events, and Power BI web parts. For example, the group calendar web part allows you to put an Office 365 group calendar right on your page so that it's easily visible to you and your readers. The Power BI report web part allows you to easily embed an interactive Power BI report on your page. In the next slide, I'll show you some examples, but first, a few more points about web parts. Web parts are configurable, reusable, purpose-built components, and the SharePoint framework can be used to power these web parts. There is also a tool called the SharePoint Workbench, which acts as a sort of development test surface for local development. And of course, you can deploy your client-side web parts to be hosted and run on your SharePoint sites. Finally, client-side web parts are context-aware. What I mean by this is that they're aware of properties of the SharePoint site that they're being run inside of. For example, these properties might include the web title, absolute URL, or even the user sign-in name, as well as getting access to any of the SharePoint lists of the underlying SharePoint site. All of this can be used to customize and change the behavior of your web part inside of SharePoint. Let's look at a few web part examples. Here you see me inside of SharePoint. To add a web part, you simply go to the edit page, click the plus sign, and you'll begin seeing all of the web parts that are available to you. As you can see, there's quite a list of web parts that come out of the box for you. I'm just going to add the event page quick. And in here, you can see all of the upcoming events. As you can see, I don't have any right now. Of course, you can go in and you can edit this web part so you can change the look of it and you can change some of the other properties. Some of the other more popular web parts that I spoke about was Bing News. Let's add that and you take a look. And here you, I can see a list of news coming in from the SharePoint web part. So you can quickly begin seeing how these web parts can be used to create really illustrative and really powerful websites for end users. Let's talk about the common needs of the various people who interact with SharePoint web parts. The end user should be able to use their tools regardless of which collaboration software they're using. Since every team in Microsoft Teams is backed by an underlying SharePoint site, it becomes more and more important to the end user that their workflow tools are able to bridge seamlessly between one another. 
For example, when an end user uses the Files tab in Microsoft Teams, they're actually interacting with the files stored into the SharePoint site without knowing the difference between one or the other. The same experience should be afforded to the end user. The user should be able to use the same LOB app across multiple Office products. Speaking of LOB, or line of business apps, the IT admin wishes to reduce the number of places and ways to manage and deploy solutions to their end users or to their internal employees. One of the challenges big IT organizations face is getting approval to deploy and run their new internal applications, and that's something that the SharePoint framework does quite well, is that it runs on SharePoint for free, making it much easier to spin up and manage an application in what is usually an already IT-approved environment, such as SharePoint. In an enterprise environment, it can always be tricky to get approval to host any new application. You need to get approval for the server costs, and you have to make sure that the data is secure. This is something that SharePoint handles for you out of the box. As a developer, and especially as a developer who considers themselves a Microsoft developer, you want to code up your solution once and have it work across multiple Office products and workloads. One of the great things about SharePoint and Teams is that they're both backed by a modern group and are accessible via the graph, so the developer concepts are very much aligned. If you're an Office 365 developer, then you want to feel at home regardless of which Microsoft product you're building an app or extension for. So what does this mean for SharePoint and Teams? Let's take a look at how the SharePoint framework and Teams can work seamlessly together. On the left, you can see a fairly complex lead management SharePoint web part exposed inside of Teams. This application does a number of things. It uses SharePoint lists to store information, and it also queries graph to get the names and profile pictures of the various team members. I'll leave a link to the code on GitHub at the end of the presentation so you can try it out for yourself. A great thing about this SharePoint web part is that it just works inside of Teams. Tabs are automatically hosted and executed in the context of SharePoint, yet they're also made aware of the fact that they're running inside of Teams. For example, you can get the channel name or the theme of the Teams tab you're running inside of and use that information to change or customize the look and feel of your web part. Let's talk about hosting, because that's an important one. Hosting a web part in SharePoint to be used in Teams does not cost you anything extra. In addition, SharePoint will host your application on their battle-tested global CDN. IT admins can rest easy knowing that any additional applications can be managed in one location through SharePoint, making it much easier to maintain. Finally, you can take advantage of all of SharePoint's great capabilities inside of your Teams tab. With the use of lists, graph, and more, you can create some really powerful end-to-end -end solutions. Let's take a look at a demo that showcases the power of SharePoint and Teams together and how you can use Graph and even Flow to create a collaborative application that can be hosted in SharePoint or in Teams. Let's take a look at a demo. Here you'll see a demo called Care that we've created. This demo is built entirely using the SharePoint framework, and you can see just how powerful it is here. Here you'll see a makeshift hospital where we can assign different caretakers to each of the rooms. Again, all of this is built inside of the SharePoint framework and it's running seamlessly inside of Teams. Here you can see a list of activities or requests that have to happen. These are being stored inside of a SharePoint list. And here you can see the ability to assign to various people. That, that list of people with their avatar and their username, that's all coming from Graph and from the underlying SharePoint site. So all of that information, all that data is made available to the developer when they're inside of Teams. Okay, and one of the other things that we can do is, you'll notice over here, these messages are replying back into the main conversation feed. The way that that was done was a combination of using Graph and by using Microsoft Flow to trigger the messages that get sent into the Teams channel. With the demo out of the way, let's look at the architecture and how this all works behind the scenes. First, your SharePoint framework solution is deployed to your Office 365 tenant using the Tenant App Catalog, which some of you may already be familiar with. The Tenant App Catalog is where all of your team's tenants' internal applications are stored. From SharePoint, an admin can then expose the application in Teams. Next, a manifest file, which Teams can understand, is created and deployed to the team's line of business catalog. This can be done manually or with a SharePoint Yeoman generator or automatically from SharePoint, which makes a graph call to programmatically create the app in the Teams line of business catalog behind the scenes. This will make the application available in Teams for your internal users to begin using. Your application will appear in the Add a Tab experience just like any other Teams application. You can customize your application to match your company's branding. Here you can see our Legal Matters application in the Add a Tab dialog window.
Next, your app's configuration experience is the same as it would be in SharePoint. Any of the configuration settings you've enabled in SharePoint will appear in the configuration dialog inside of Teams. Any settings you configure will be saved in a SharePoint list as a configuration property. With your application finally available inside of Teams, it's time to render it to the screen. What does that look like? Your SharePoint component renders in a dedicated layout page, which is iframed inside of Teams. If you've ever visited a SharePoint site and looked at the URL, you should be aware of the layout in the URL. For those unfamiliar with SharePoint, think of the layout container as the parent frame that will give you everything you need to securely run and render your SharePoint web part. It will take care of any authentication and graph access for you. Great, now that your SharePoint framework web part is beginning to load, we may want to change how it looks or behaves depending on where it's being loaded. We call this the context. So the next thing you will receive is some context about where your application is being executed. You still have SharePoint relevant information, such as getting access to any SharePoint list data, but you'll also get context information about teams, such as the theme, if they're using dark mode, or even the channel name that you can use to customize how your web part looks inside of teams. All of your assets are stored in SharePoint's asset library. These assets were deployed back in step one when we first uploaded your app to be hosted in SharePoint. Finally, I should point out that your assets will also be globally distributed and made readily available on SharePoint's battle-tested CDN. You can begin to see just how many things SharePoint takes care of for you. For any developer looking to build an enterprise solution, it just makes sense to start with SharePoint because it handles hosting, authentication, distribution, lists of data, graph access, and so much more. These are just things you don't want to think about every time you build a line of business application for your organization. I just want to take a second and zoom in on the line of business app catalog inside of Teams. Here's what it looks like. You can see your company, Contoso, has three internal applications made available to its employees through Teams. Your company gets its own place in the Teams app store. You can see Contoso is selected on the left-hand side. When a user goes to add a tab, then we surface LOB apps available to that team, ensuring admin approved apps are near the top. Users can then configure the app to their specific channel or needs. I want to briefly talk about authentication and graph at a high level, since those can be tricky subjects. The good news is that we handle everything seamlessly in the background for you, but it may be worthwhile understanding how authentication and graph access is being orchestrated behind the scenes. First, let's talk about authentication. Authentication in the browser is much easier to handle than it is in the desktop client for Teams. This is because the browser can leverage cookie-based authentication, while with the desktop client we're stuck having to handle token-related obligations of authentication. Firstly, and most importantly, authentication is silently handled between Teams and SharePoint Online. We take care of the authentication for you. Teams provides the token client side to SharePoint, which they can then convert to a cookie on the server side. With a cookie set, the layout page is all the information it needs to begin rendering to the screen with no additional authentication steps required. As expected, you get full access to the SharePoint REST API. Now let's talk about Graph. In order to understand how we seamlessly made Graph work is to understand token exchange. Since there are essentially three components, the Teams client, SharePoint Online, and the SharePoint web part, we have to exchange tokens a few times before the underlying web part is granted access. The SharePoint framework client libraries understand that the call is coming from Teams and steps in the middle to begin requesting tokens on behalf of the various components. Once all of the tokens have been exchanged, then the flow returns to SharePoint Online with an access token. Did you guys catch all that? With this access token, the web part can now execute the web API calls to the graph. If you just can't wait any longer and you can't wait to get your hands dirty, then there's no better place to start than the Yeoman Project Generator. A SharePoint web part can come in many flavors. If you remember back to one of my earlier slides, I showed you all the various web frameworks that the SharePoint framework supports. So the Yeoman Generator makes it easy because it prompts you with all the various questions that you need to get set up, such as which web framework you'd like to use. Once the generator has finished, it will have created a project scaffold, which has all of your project pre-baked with the correct folders and file names. Also, the generator will generate two special folders, a SharePoint folder and a Teams folder. Each folder will contain code that you can use to deploy your code to either application. So to get started, I recommend running npm install and then npm install Microsoft Generator SharePoint. Here's what the Yeoman Generator looks like after it's run. You can see all the types of questions it asks, such as the solution name near the top, and at the very bottom, it's asking which JavaScript framework you'd like to use. Again, I highly recommend getting your hands on the Yeoman Generator if you'd like to try your hands at building SharePoint web parts that can also run inside of Teams.
Before we reach the end, I just wanted to mention that your Teams tab can also be exposed as a web part in SharePoint really easily. The Teams app manifest zip file can now be dragged and dropped into your SharePoint app catalog and SharePoint will automatically turn your Teams application into a usable web part that you can share with your team inside of SharePoint. That's it, folks. Thanks for making it this far. Before I go, I'd like to quickly talk about resources to get you started. If you want to get started right away and start building your first web part for Teams, I recommend the first link, aka.ms slash dash teams. It will take you through everything you need to get started and it also has a really useful tutorial video. Next, I highly recommend the SPFX training link as it was just recently updated with a lot of great new content to get you started and familiarized with SharePoint development. If you want to try your hands out on that lead management application that I showed you earlier, you can find it by visiting the SharePoint GitHub page. There is a project called sp-dev-solutions that has a huge collection of solutions for you to check out. That's it, folks.